as we can to get permission at this point. Okay. Can everybody hear me fine? Yes. Okay, good. All right. Excellent. All right. So um, this is all heart. This is the uh, webinar for the first one, January 2023. And the reason I chose heart disease um, and heart health is because it really is and has been the number one killer of both men and women in the United States since 1950. <laughs> we clearly are not doing a great job with our heart health. So um, I just thought, so I'm gonna go over a little bit about the structure and function of the heart, what a healthy heart looks like, and then we'll go into some heart disease and even some testing and treatments and stuff and uh, maybe how to prevent it. So I do not have a problem. I haven't actually muted you all. I'm gonna trust everybody to either mute themselves, but if we're in a slide or something and you actually have a question and you'd like to ask me a question, uh, for this particular seminar, feel free to interrupt me and just say, hey, Cass, I have a quick question and we'll try to answer while the slides even up, okay? That sound good? All right. All right, so I'm gonna share the screen and let's get into this. All right, so all heart. I always uh, have to do a disclosure statement, so I have no relevant financial relationships. Um, I do this because I really want to share public knowledge um, and information. I do have a separate uh, nurse coaching business. I'm happy to help you out with things, but I do these strictly for educational purposes. Okay, the heart. <laughs> so if you look, uh, I believe it'll be on your left-hand side. Um, you're looking at a normal heart. So the normal heart has four chambers, two on top, two on the bottom. They represent, the blue side represents blood that's coming back from the body, not, not with as much oxygen, and it goes to the lungs, gets a little oxygen, comes back to the left side. Um, it goes from the atrium to the ventricle, and then back out to the body. Yes, I'm only seeing. Somebody got a question one. for me. I'm only one more time. seeing. I'm only seeing slide one. Uh, okay. Me too. I'm not. Great. I'm not seeing a hat. Yeah. No, I'm not seeing. Okay, a that's. Hot. Well, that's really not good. Okay, so hold on. Let me pull out. All right. How about now? I'm seeing you. Okay, hold on one second. Uh, let's try this one more time. We're not gonna do it as a PowerPoint, how about now? Yes. 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 You see yes, the heart but, now? Yes. Yes, but we're seeing your whole screen, not just the slide. I know, but I think we're just gonna have to leave it like that. So I'm just gonna, okay. I'm gonna leave it like that. I don't know what's going on. I'll figure it out later, I'm so sorry. But anyway, so this is the normal heart, right? So again, we're looking at the left-hand side. We talk about the upper chambers, the lower chambers. Um, the right-hand side is showing um, hypertrophy. And what that, just that means, if, if you just look at that lower left-hand uh, ventricle, see how little space there is? When people have a heart problem over a long period of time, especially with uh, high blood pressure, sometimes this happens and clearly it can't fill the way that the left side can, right? So the normal heart fills a lot more in that chamber and gets more oxygen to places. Okay, so you guys advanced with me, correct? Yes. You see in a new slide? Yes. Yes. Yes? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, so your heart is the primary organ of your circulatory system. It pumps throughout the body. So it's a bit like a house. I do want you to think of it as a house. It has walls, rooms, doors, plumbing, and electrical system. So we're gonna talk about structure, plumbing, and electrical. All the parts of your heart work together. It not only keeps blood flowing and gets nutrients to your organs, but it actually also takes care of pulling off waste. So that's another big part of it. Basic facts, the electrical part. Um, there are impulses 
that set the rate and regularity, right? So electrical sets rate and regularity. Plumbing has to do with how the blood flows. It's valves and vessels. Um, when we think of plumbing, it's valves and vessels. And structure has to do with the actual cardiac muscle. And that has to do with pump and performance. How well does your heart pump? And what's its performance? How is it doing? You know, if 100% uh, if performance is the best, are you at 100% or are you not? Electrical. So we're, I'm going to start with electrical. Um, we talk about an intrinsic rate. So the little yellow um, lines are what they're, what they're referring to as the electrical system. So it goes from the SA node to the AV node and down around the bottom of the heart. And that's what actually forces the heart to contract and also tells it when to relax. So if you look, you know, this, there's more detail than you probably need to know, but the top part, the SA node, it says that it wants to be at 60 to 100 times a minute. That's what our normal heart rate is. So the SA node should be the leader of the heart. It should be the leader of the band, the one that's setting the rate. Unfortunately, what happens sometimes is that there is a disconnect. There's like a, sh a, a shortage in the wire or a, a short or a disconnect. And so instead of it going from the SA node to the AV node and down around, the AV node decides it's going to be the leader. And so that creates all sorts of problems because the SA node is firing, the AV node is firing, and they're out of sync. Mm -hmm. um, also, if you notice at the very bottom, it says ventricular muscle. If neither of those are firing and your electricity is really out of whack, your ventricle will fire, but it's going to fire at a really slow rate, 20 to 40 beats per minute. That's very slow. You are not going to feel well. Um, and the ions, the, the ions that we look for when we want to know or when we're concerned about the electrical system are your potassium and your magnesium levels. Um, potassium level that's too high is normally a bigger problem than low. Uh, magnesium, too low is usually more of a problem than high. Um, so just so you know, we, we do actually look for those um, when we're thinking about the electricity of the heart and the regularity of it. Plumbing. So this is strictly valves and your vessels, right? So the blue side is deoxygenated. There's not a lot of oxygen in it. So it's going from the body to the lungs, and that's through the right atrium, through the tricuspid valve, exactly what it says. There's three leafs, tri, tricuspid valve, to the right ventricle. On the other side, you get oxygenated blood coming in through the pulmonary vein. It goes to the left atrium through a mitral valve. The mitral valve actually only has two leaflets, um, but the mitral valve is really important. We don't want, both of these valves are one-way valves. Blood should never go from the ventricles up to the atriums, and they're only supposed to flow from the atrium down to the ventricles. So sometimes that's why people will say they have bad valves. Um, and from the left ventricle, it goes to the rest of the body, fully oxygenated, and hopefully comes right back to you. And then the last part is the structure. So I wanted to talk about structure because um, sometimes we forget that there's this you know, the heart itself sits in our cavity on the left side of our chest, just a little bit off center. It is pointed downward. So the point of the chest, uh, the point of the heart does point down towards um, your left hand hip, your left hip. And if you notice around the heart, there's adipose tissue, fat tissue. So if you have a ton of belly fat, if you have a ton of fat in your abdominal cavity, there is a chance that you're gonna have a buildup of additional fat around your heart. That's not gonna make it function well. There's also the pericardium, the epicardium, the myocardium, and the endocardium. There's a lot of these like layers. So when people say they have pericarditis or endocarditis or uh, myocarditis, it's an inflammation of those different layers or cavities. Um, and again, that, can make it so that your heart's trying to beat almost like it's underwater because it's swollen, like a like a sprained ankle might be. 
when, when it's inflamed, it's just not going to function well. So I wanted to talk a little bit about tests. So these are the tests that we use to, um, to check the function of the heart. Most of you probably have had at least one or two of these done. Um, on the upper left-hand side is an EKG, right? So they put 12 leads on you and they run an EKG. And for the most part, that checks the electricity um, of your heart, but how the electricity travels to different parts of your heart gives us a real clue on the structure. The middle top is a stress test. That's a stress test where you're gonna actually run or walk fast enough to get your heart rate elevated. Uh, if you can't do that, there's a stress test where you can lay on a table and they'll inject uh, a drug into your IV that would actually simulate running on the treadmill. Um, upper right-hand corner is a blood pressure. There's a reason they take a blood pressure at every visit. It tells an awful lot. We can do an awful lot with blood pressure, whether you're sitting, whether you're standing. Um, we can tell an awful lot from that blood pressure, and it's very, it's a really, it's a very helpful measurement. And we'll talk about it, but it's something you probably should be doing at home. Blood work. If you came into an emergency room or um, they were concerned about things like heart failure, they might run a troponin. Uh, troponin is only released when cardiac muscle is damaged. It, you would never find it in your blood work any other time. It's only released with cardiac muscle. It's very, very specific. BNP is a way to kind of tell if there's extra fluid on your body. Um, so we run a BNP for people with heart failure or if they have really big swollen legs and they haven't had an injury and we're worried that they're retaining fluid. A BNP might tell us something. Potassium and magnesium we already talked about. Uh, in the middle on the bottom is a cardiac catheterization. We use that not only to diagnose, but also sometimes to treat. And then the last one in the uh, lower right-hand corner is an echocardiogram. The echocardiogram is strictly for flow and structure. It's not gonna tell us much about electricity at all. So what's normal? Normal is a blood pressure that's between 100 and 129 over 70 to 90. So if you're 100 over 70, you're in the normal range. If you are 129 over 90, you technically are sitting in the normal range. The 90 is like right, right there at the uh, at a number you might want to treat. But um, anything over 129, systolically, that top number, somebody's probably going to want to take a look at. Anything over 90 on the lower number, we also probably want to treat. Lower blood pressure is almost never a problem unless it makes you feel dizzy. Even um, I, no joke, I had a patient this morning and his blood pressure was 69 over 40. <laughs> That's really not good, especially not good, not in the hospital. But that was only standing. And when he sits down, it recovers and he has no symptoms with it. So he just gets to drink a lot more water uh, today. But, um, but blood pressure matters. Um, heart rate, 60 to 100 beats a minute. Um, slower is fine when you're sleeping, faster with activity. If you're running around or going out for a good walk, 120, 130, not a problem. If you're an athlete or when you're sleeping, your heart rate goes down to 50 or even 45, usually not a problem either, unless you have, you're have you having some sort of symptoms. Your heart rate should be regular. It should follow a consistent beat. It needs to go like a song. You can choose any song you like, but it should be very regular. It just beats regular. When it's irregular, it does need to be checked. It doesn't mean you got to run to the emergency room, but your primary care or a cardiologist, if you have it, they have to check because there's one type of irregular beat that could be serious and needs treatment, but there are other kinds like that are benign. Um, they just happen once in a while and they are not dangerous at all, but you feel it. You might feel it a little bit. But that needs to be checked out. You shouldn't just ignore that, please. Ejection fraction, the EF. An EF of 65% or greater is normal. So you might say, uh-oh, my EF is only 65 or 
that's okay. Um, we don't expect the heart to function at 100% capacity. Um, as long as it's functioning over 65, we're pretty happy. And the EF is usually only calculated during an echocardiogram, but it's, it's a big part of an echocardiogram. It tells us a lot about how the pump of your heart is working. And you should have little to no swelling in your feet or lower legs when you wake up. It's not unusual for people to have swelling in their legs at the end of a day, right? So we call that dependent edema, right? You've, you've been walking around all day or you've been working um, and your legs are swollen. That's a good reason to put your legs up, right? But what's not okay is if you wake up in the morning and your legs look big. That's telling us something different. That, that usually has to do with the pump of the heart and, and it not being able to pull off extra fluid. Like it, you know, as you know, as you pump blood through all your veins, it's going to pick up extra waste from cells and it's supposed to flow beautifully right back to the heart or right through the kidneys and they take out the extra water. If you don't have enough pump, if you don't have enough pressure, that's not going to happen. And that, that'll lead to that swelling. All right, so types of heart disease. There's, this, this is why it's the number one killer because there's lots of different types of heart disease. Valve, so I'm gonna start at one o'clock, valve disease. So valve disease, remember we talked about that could be the, art, the um, atrial valve or the tricuspid valve. There's a couple of other valves, but usually a lot of people actually, the atrial valve is the one that becomes, uh, they use the word stenosis, it becomes stiff. Um, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't open and shut tightly. And so what happens is when it shuts, it's still allowing blood to leak and the blood leaks backwards into the upper chamber. That usually needs to get fixed. It usually makes people feel tired. An aneurysm, that's at three o'clock. The aneurysm, a thoracic aneurysm is, it's a bulging of your vessel and they're probably going to want to go in and fix that. Uh, it's unusual if it's a, vessel of the heart that has an aneurysm, if they get any sort of advanced notice, they're going to try to fix that. Unfortunately, aneurysms are normally found after they've ruptured. So never a good sign when it's an aneurysm. Uh, at five o'clock, cardiac arrhythmias. This is the disturbance with the electrical system. So uh, one node or the other is either not talking to each other or they're both talking at the same time and they're creating beats that are completely irregular. Sometimes they end up being fast. The real risk with a cardiac arrhythmia is that the lower chamber of the left ventricle can actually form some clots in the bottom because all the blood doesn't push out when, it's, when, when it contracts and those clots can go forward to the brain and that would of course be a stroke. So we are always worried about um, any sort of clots traveling to the brain and causing a stroke. Um, at six o'clock, cardiomyopathy. That's a thickening of the myocardium. So we talked about this on the very first slide. Um, we didn't go back to it, but, but uh, what happens is that left side, look how thick that wall is. If you could imagine, one, the, the ventricle is not holding much blood and two, it's not gonna contract very well because it's very dense. So it's not gonna contract like a balloon would, you know, you can't like, you can't just squeeze it like you would a balloon. It, it kind of has some stiffness to it. This is almost always a direct result of long-term untreated elevated blood pressure. So that's why we call blood pressure the silent killer because it's not gonna kill you immediately, but it is slowly gonna cause a problem that Honestly, we really don't have a way to fix. At seven o'clock, pericarditis. That is just an inflammation in any of the layers. So pericarditis is inflammation in the pericardium. Uh, like I said, you could have myocarditis, you could have endocarditis. It's just inflamed. And again, inflamed, it's like walking on a swollen ankle, except you can't ask the heart to rest. It's going to keep beating, which is good. <laughs> Heart failure at nine o'clock. Heart failure is an awful term. People, I, I wish they would change the term because it doesn't mean your heart has completely failed. People live with heart failure for 20, 30 years. 
what it does mean is that your heart is not pumping effectively anymore. What they're saying is there's a dilated ventricle. It's almost too thin, right? Either way, at the end of the day, your heart is not pumping effectively. And so we, we need to find new ways to help it to pump effectively. And also you might have to modify uh, some of your activities through the day to be able to deal with heart failure. It's, it is treatable. Uh, people live with it, some with very few symptoms, but it, it, it creates a whole new level of management when you have heart failure. And coronary artery, artery disease. Uh, if you ever look on your electronic chart, this would show up as CAD. We call it a CAD. Oh, they have CAD, coronary artery disease. That This is almost exclusively caused by cholesterol, buildup of cholesterol. If you look in the vessel, see how it says fatty deposits? That is high cholesterol, uh, kind of laying a layer of fat inside your vessel and the, the, there's two big concerns. One, if it gets built up enough, it will seal off the vessel and then your heart won't get blood. And we call that a heart attack. <laughs> and then the other one is the fatty deposit somehow breaks free and goes flying through your system. Again, kind of like a clot, but it's not a clot because it's a fatty deposit. If it lodges in your brain, it's going to look just like uh, an embolic stroke. So uh, coronary artery disease is something again that can be managed uh, pretty easily. Actually, they, you know, we have great ways to manage it, but you got to tell somebody, otherwise, we can't manage it. Um, so heart disease. I had a question. So I had. A, is somebody had talking to me? Yes. Yep. Um. So Go on ahead. the heart, heart disease, it doesn't list high blood pressure. Is that because it's a symptom and it's not considered a disease? Correct. It so it uh yes. So when you have hot elevated blood pressure, if it's untreated, it is essentially heart disease, yes. If it's treated high blood, so we, we either we call it uh blood pressure that is controlled, right? Like, so we'll say hypertension, controlled hypertension or uncontrolled hypertension. If it is controlled hypertension, then um, then it's essentially normal. So it's not causing any of that damage we just showed. However, if it is not controlled, so it's uncontrolled hypertension, then yes, it is in fact a, a form of heart disease. They would call it CAD. It falls under the category of CAD, coronary artery disease, because the buildup, that buildup um, in your arteries also causes elevated pressure. Does that make sense? I don't know why I am struggling to hear you guys today. So hold on. I just yes, want to see. Oh, you. this could be it. All right. Much better. Okay. I got you. All right. Thank you. So I'm going to go back. Okay, good. I'm going to go back to... I thought I was going to go back to that. Let's see. Um, let's go back to share screen. All right. Um, statins. So statins help to lower your cholesterol. And there's been some great research just in the last maybe six to eight months that basically say it can lower the risk of heart attacks. We so they're becoming... It's a black. Oh, we're back to. Oh, okay. All right. So let's. Huh. That is really weird. Um. Hmm. All right. Oh, that's not good. All right. This is horrible. All right. Um, hmm. Try that one more time. I don't know why I came out of it the first time, but all right. How's it now? Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. All right. Okay. So statins, 
Um, so there is a, a lot of people don't want to take statins, right? They're like, do I really need, you know, cholesterol medicine? Can I just do it with diet and exercise? Yes, you probably could if you're really committed. And I would always say, if you want to try for six months, that's great. But if in six months you can't get your um, cholesterol under control, I, I really strongly suggest you consider taking a statin. Uh, beta blockers. Beta blockers, uh, they have a dual purpose. Not only do they reduce your blood pressure, they can reduce your heart rate, but really the other thing they do is they help your, your heart to pump more effectively. Beta blockers are actually prescribed a lot. Like we, we use them as a front line uh, for an awful lot of cardiac disease and they work really beautifully. Uh, people would know them as metaprolol or possibly toparol XL. Those are kind of the two big, the biggest beta blockers. They're the same, one's long acting, one's short acting. Blood thinners. Um, if you have that irregular heartbeat, like an atrial fibrillation or your, your heartbeat is not regular and it's one of the concerning um, irregularities, we might put you on a blood thinner because we don't want those clots to form in the lower left-hand ventricle. So you get on a blood thinner so that it decreases the risk of you having a clot go to your brain, which would be a stroke. And clearly lifestyle changes, right? We, we talk about this all the time. There's an awful lot we can do with improving diet, exercise, giving up smoking. Smoking's a big one for people who smoke. Um, even alcohol intake, at some point, you might have to take a look at that. And then on the far right side, I did just put um, treatments, other treatments, cardiac catheterization. That's uh, when we go in and kind of open up those vessels, you kind of push the fatty deposits to the side. Um, and that actually can widen the vessel and you wouldn't have the same, um, you wouldn't have the same risk factors. Um, a TAVR, we call it a, a TAVR, trans catheter aortic valve. We do also do that with a catheter, but they can replace the aortic valve. And uh, a lot of people do this. They've actually done studies. This is safe for people as old as 95 years old. And they've actually done studies that say it's worth it um, if people are active and moving around and you know uh, have a good life, it's worth giving it a shot. And ablation or cardioversion. So if you have that irregular heartbeat that is not um, benign, uh, it is, it, it's probably causing atrial fibrillation An ablation or cardioversion. Uh, both of them are a way to reset the heart. You either kill off some of the nerve endings that are, or the electrical signals, right? So you're actually going to cut electrical signals so that everybody stays where they're supposed to, or cardioversion. You actually stop the heart and you hope when it restarts itself, it goes back to that AV node. So they really do stop the heart there. Symptoms we shouldn't ignore. Please don't ignore these symptoms. Um, so, and this is a tough one. To a certain degree, these symptoms could mean a heart attack, but we're talking about the, the time. So I'll give you a great example. My, my father-in-law lived on the second floor of an apartment building. He was obese and he did have asthma. And for about two months, it felt like it was getting harder and harder to climb the stairs. Now in his mind, it was that he was out of shape and that his asthma was kicking in. He didn't check with his primary care. He didn't call anybody. He didn't call his pulmonologist. He never went in for a checkup. He did die of a massive coronary, a massive heart attack at the two month um, mark. Now, probably what was happening is he had a small uh, narrowing in a vessel and that, that became a blockage and that blockage created the heart attack, right? So if you're having, you know, if you just have more fatigue than usual, um, if you have more shortness of breath than usual, if you feel like your heart's racing, but then it stops, but then it does it again, but then it stops. Those are the things you can call your primary care, try to get a same day appointment. And as long as it's not like an impending sense of doom or pain in your chest or, you know, like clearly then we're going to do a 911 call. But sometimes it's, it's, you know, boy, I only get dizziness when I first wake up in the morning. It's worth telling your primary care. Um, I have a cough that I can't get rid of. It's worth calling your primary care. Um, 
for my mom, the chest discomfort always felt like she, you know, she said, I feel like an elephant sitting on my chest, but she had no other symptoms of anything. So it was kind of nice. We could take her to the doctor and, um, and eventually she did get a car cardiac catheterization. And the guy came out and said, it's definitely not her heart. It's got to be her lungs. <laughs> you know? So, so that was good, but we needed to get it checked out. You got to get it checked out. So please don't ignore um, swelling in your legs or this feeling of weakness. If you feel weak and you're not used to feeling weak, get it checked out. And then the, you know, lastly, so not lastly, but a heart attack. These are the warning signs of a heart attack. Women, it's a little different than men. Women tend to have more nausea or feeling sick to their stomach. Even that, like, um, that feeling that overcomes you when you're like going to have diarrhea, you know, like an all body, almost like a, like a sweating kind of, uh, you know, just that feeling that sometimes is what women present with. Then it's not always chest pain. It's chest pressure. Men tend to have chest pain. Men tend to talk about um, numbness down their left arm, but it, you can look at these. Um, any of this is please don't drive yourself to the emergency room. Call 911. Nobody's going to say to you, oh, I can't believe you called me to take you to the hospital and you're fine. That's a heart attack is a serious thing, can be managed well if you detect it soon enough and you get to it soon enough. So don't be um, don't be reluctant to make that call. If, if you really feel like you're having a heart attack, trust me, you won't even think twice about calling 911. You'll just do it and do it and don't worry about it. OK. So managing heart health. So I purposely chose two different articles, one that was for those with heart disease and one for those without heart disease. And if you look at these two lists, they are almost identical. And honestly, they probably should be totally identical. I just stayed true to the actual articles. But the, the, the real takeaway is that for those who have heart disease, they have to, you know, they start managing in probably a more serious manner because they now have heart disease and they're worried about it, right? The thing is, it's 90% preventable. So for those of us without heart disease, we can actually make a difference now and, and it'll carry over. I promise you it'll carry over. So look at, we'll look at those with heart disease. So learn your family heart history. You definitely should know that. And especially when they get heart disease, it's really, it's very critical. But, you know, if dad had a heart attack at 50 and mom has coronary artery disease and your uncle has had a stroke at 65, like that should tell you something about your family heart history. You should be, you know, a little proactive there. Um, eat a healthy diet, move more, sit less, quit smoking take medications as prescribed, uh, choose your drinks wisely. They mean less sugary drinks and less alcohol. <laughs> I, just, I just put it there like that because it sounds nicer. Um, but yeah, less alcohol, less sugary drinks. Monitor your blood pressure at home. Again, something you should probably be doing even without heart disease. It's not a bad idea. Taking it um, once a week, twice a week uh, at home at a regular time, either in the morning or at night or middle of the day. But set it to a regular time, it's good for you to take that to your primary care doctor's appointment and just let them know what your pressures have been doing at home because a lot of us have elevated pressures in the office. Without heart disease, they're asking you to be more physically active. That's move more, sit less. If you smoke, quit, quit smoking. Follow a healthy heart diet, limit salt. We've talked about this. Salt in the US is over and above the amount that is acceptable for the American Heart Association. We use a ton of salt. And even if you say, no, no, Kath, I don't add salt when I cook. There is salt in every, it's, it's bacon, it's sausage, it's sandwich meats, it's every soup you've ever grabbed, um, unless you make it yourself. For us to limit salt and still feel satisfied eating, you gotta add things like, you know, green pepper, garlic, onions, you got to flavor it with, you know, cayenne, with something that gives it a little kick because you're going to feel the lack of salt when you don't have salt. Keeping a healthy weight, um, trying to just keep your BMI in that healthy category. Control other conditions like diabetes, cholesterol, or blood pressure. Again, controlled cholesterol and controlled blood pressure 
actually don't allow those, the buildup in the vessels or the buildup around the left ventricle. If it's controlled, it's as if you don't have the condition. But if you stop taking your meds, it's not controlled. Choose your drinks wisely, exactly the same, and manage stress. To be honest, that should be for people with heart disease too. Managing stress, we can't say enough about managing stress. I put this up here because um, it's just my classic. What fits your busy schedule better? This is exercising an hour a day. Nobody's even asking you to do that. American Heart Association says 20 minutes, 20 minutes a day. Uh, we would say maybe 30 minutes. Can you get three 10 minute intervals of a walk, um, dancing, cleaning the house? There's so many things you can do, something you enjoy doing, right? It doesn't have to be running on a treadmill. That's not the point. Fit it into your regular schedule. Um, I'm, I've started doing 10 minutes of yoga in the morning. It just kind of helps me to not be so stiff when I get up, but it's 10 minutes. Um, I can find 10 minutes. Resources. So this, this million hearts at hhs.gov is a fabulous site. There are so many great tools on this site. I, I kind of love it. And the goal of million hearts is to decrease the amount of heart disease in the US, I think by like 20% by 2030 or something. I, but it's a great, it's a great site. Uh, American Heart Association has a ton of great information and the CDC under heart disease also does. And we're gonna just finish up with this. You know, I, I am always available. I'll, I, I'm more than happy to help you uh, coach you to a place where we could try to bring your blood pressure under control, stress reduction, um, cholesterol reduction, and um, any sort of care assistance I'm happy to do. All right. So I do want to make sure that we have time for questions. So does anybody have questions? I know that was the quickest ever. Yes, Jen, I see you. So um, for like my, my mom has a pacemaker and my dad had a pacemaker. Is that for irregular heartbeats or is that? So that's a great question. It could be, this could be two different reasons. So yes, sometimes irregular heartbeats, that's why they do it. Sometimes it's because to control somebody's blood pressure, it takes so much medication that it drives the heart rate down. So like when we talked about metaprolol, we talked about a beta blocker. So if in order to control your blood pressure, I have to make your heart rate 40, you're going to feel awful because you can't really do anything with your heartbeat at 40. So they put a pacemaker in. So the pacemaker keeps you at 60. So you're ready to go. And they can still give you medicine to drive down your blood pressure. So sometimes that's why. Sometimes it's blood pressure control and some, you know, medication. They need enough medication to control your heart conditions, but that medication is going to make you have a crazy low heart rate. So they put a pacer in. But you're right, sometimes it is atrial fibrillation. And so what they do is they put a pacer in and the pacer is set to fire if it gets too fast or too slow. And some pacers also work to be like an AED. If your heart stops, they'll actually shock your heart. The patient would look like somebody just put paddles on them. So there, there, there is that kind of pacer as well. <laughs> so I had a question about um, blood pressure medications. Um, and you and I have actually talked about it a couple of times. Um, you were mentioning beta blockers like the Metro, Pro, whatever. Metaprolol. Uh, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, but also that they need like, like cousin medicines to help them actually work properly. So like I'm on the first one, but I'm now I'm on two more medications for high blood pressure and it that's normal is that correct it, it is actually because so each one works a little differently so there's like ion channel blockers there's beta blockers <laughs> so there's there's like three different kinds so it's actually usual that you're going to need more than one medication to control blood pressure you might initially only need one 
but it usually progresses to where you need at least two and some people do need three. So there, that's not unusual. And it, it has to do with, with coming at it from three different areas. So remember it's um, like we're dealing with ions, we're dealing with the electricity of the heart, the plumbing of the heart and the structure. So they're kind of attacking from three different avenues. And so, you know, the systolic is the contraction of the heart. The diastolic is the resting. For a lot of people, they don't rest. So actually that number's high, right? Instead of the 90, you know, you might be 140 over 110. Well, it's the 110 we're worried about, mm -hmm. right? So we need, to, we need your heart to relax. We're going to need a different drug to make it relax than we are to make it pump. So yes, yeah, so that sometimes they work in, um, in conjunction with each other. Thank you. Any time? Just out of curiosity, how many of you have a cardiologist? Does anybody? No. I actually, I actually have one because I had a scare once and I had to wear a monitor for a month. So I technically have one. I haven't seen her in 10 years, but I technically have one. Um, not no, yet. No. Family his, history dictates I will soon. <laughs> it's not a bad thing to have. Again, better to choose one before it's desperate and thrown upon you. At least then you can choose who you want. <laughs> I have a question. I'm not certain if you can hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Um, I am 55 and my... Um, my father had to have open heart surgery last year. He has obviously high blood pressure. He has um, cardio. He has uh, the stenosis. He has all the, um, the CAD. And he also had to have a valve yep. replacement. So he's on three different medications. He is also a diabetic and he's not good about treating it. His father mm -hmm. also had all the same things. Um, I know that I'm just kind of curious, like uh, we, I go to the doctor much more regularly. I go once a year or twice a year and I check my blood pressure at home and I've been watching my, my cholesterol. My LDL is definitely, it's below 200. It's actually at 200 right now, but my LDL is certainly higher than my HDL. So I've been working on trying to see what I can do just um, and through my diet to try to get that reduced. But, you know, at what point and what, at what point should um, I sh try to be screened or anything of that nature? I, I'm just kind of curious, like, because, you know, I find that doctors are more reactive than they are proactive. Right. And, and that's partly we talk about this. That's partly because of how our insurance companies are, because billable, you know, you can bill once there's a diagnosis. You can't bill for education when there's no diagnosis. I, I, so, I'm not saying it's right. I'm actually saying it's crazy, but that's why. That's one of the reasons, right? And I understand. So you all that. are in a, yeah. So you are in effect screening yourself. So first of all, by monitoring your blood pressure, and um, by keeping an eye on your cholesterol. Also, do me a favor. Just keep an eye on your triglycerides. Um, that drives a lot of the cholesterol issues as well. But um, you, you're screening, so so you're doing a great job. That's great. Um, I can tell you, like my kids, it's one one. The family history should be in your record, so the doctor should be aware of the family history. My kids, all every one of them, they're now in their twenties. All of them are in their twenties. Their charts all say that there's a familial history of hypertension that needed medication before age thirty, and that's because. Um, their grandfather had it, their dad had it, even though he's running marathons and eating well, right? But his blood pressure was elevated and he needed medication. So all the kids have that. Now they may never develop that, but every doctor should have it as a possibility, something to, you know, it's not like if you go in and your blood pressure is now elevated, you shouldn't allow the doctor to say, well, Maybe we shouldn't be concerned about this. It could be diet and exercise. It could be white coat syndrome. It should be a, nope, that's not me. I haven't been this. I've been monitoring. 
we need to, you know, we need, we, we're going to probably need medication, right? So that's how you <clears throat> kind of help them to see that this is not your regular. Okay. I, I, I that's my, I, I think I'm actually at a point where I think that I'm going to change my doctor because I don't find my doctor to be a proactive doctor. She's an internal medical doctor, but I think I want to find someone who's an internal call that still has a little bit more a stronger background in, in heart related things, because I don't find that mine is, mine's always willing to kind of wait and see. And I had a situation with, um, I, I learned that I have, I had my gallbladder out at one point and I started having mm -hmm. similar pains and, um, and this is not related to the heart, but anyway, it turned out it's actually, it's the, it's the little valve flap that goes into your, um, that goes into your intestines. It doesn't function correctly, but she, uh, she didn't really want, she was very kind of lax about it. So I just kind of went around her and went right to a gastroenterologist. And, and I kind of read a lot and educated myself and went in and told him what I thought was wrong. And, and through a series of lots of tests and six months into it, we've been able to identify what the problem is, but so I'm not usually willing to settle, but uh, I, I, that's my biggest frustration. Sometimes doctors don't, um, they just don't, they're not as proactive as I think that they could be. The other thing I was wondering about what your thoughts are, since you know, you do, we do struggle with the insurance side of things. What about like all those lifeline screenings and the things that you can do like that? Are they proven to be helpful? It happened, I lost it. So that's an interesting thing. Somebody else asked me about it. Um, I would say that the, the problem is even for an EKG, an EKG takes this moment in time, this one moment in time and says, you're fine right now, not 10 minutes from now, not 20 minutes from now. Um, the lifeline screenings, when you, if you're paying attention to your symptoms, you don't need a lifeline screening because you, you, will, you will know when something changes. However, one, if, you're, if it will lower your anxiety and it's not gonna you know, cause, cause an extreme financial thing, you could certainly do it. I don't think they're, I don't think they're in any way injurious. Um, I think, um, I, I think that in general, I, I don't, I don't think they're overly helpful. It, to me, it's like going to an urgent care as opposed to your primary care. It's probably more important. And, and honestly, have you tried having a conversation with your primary care about the gastroenterologist issue and just say, Hey, listen, it made me uncomfortable. I, I don't like that you weren't proactive. I, like it might be, it might be just helpful for the primary care to know that you would like to be more proactive. Like maybe they're trying not to, you know, upset you. I, I, and I don't, I don't know. I, but I would say that everybody's primary care, you should feel like your primary care is listening to you and it's worth working hard to find one that you, that, that has the same temperament as you do um, in terms of your health and health screenings. Okay. No, I, I, that's why I kind of think I might just try to look for a different one just because, you know, I'm 55 now and um, I figure, you know, this is, you know, I'm getting into the years where this, if this is going to become more of a problem, it will become more of a problem. And I'd really want to have a doctor. I can have a lot of confidence in yeah, I think so. I'm 56, and I do think um, as soon as you hit your 50s, it is time to make sure that your primary care is is walking in lockstep with you. Um, if you if you like to be less testy, you should find a doctor that doesn't like to you know doesn't get overly flustered. You know, doesn't run a thousand tests. If you like to make sure all your ducks in a row, and you're more than happy to do extra testing, you should find a doctor who um, who kind of lives in that world with you. Okay. So let me ask, I'm sorry, let me ask one more question. So I don't take up all the time, but, um, so my dad, obviously i I take him to the doctors and I, I check on him every morning and I get his blood pressure reading and I communicate with the doctor because he's 78 and he gets all flustered. But anyway, so mm -hmm. you, you were talking about, um, he, he, they, we were travel, tra having trouble getting his medication, um, adjusted. It was really skyrocketing off. So now he's on three medications. And I, I understand there's lots of these different blockers. He's on a calcium channel blocker. He's on an ACE right. inhibitor yeah. and he's on a beta blocker. So he's on a lot. And 
when they, uh, it, it actually ended up being way too low. Like there were points where it was like 98 over 58 and things like that. So they decided they were going to try to reduce the metoprolol. And when they did that, mm-hmm. the very next day, they cut it in half. The very next day, he actually had ch- pest ch- um, pain in his chest. That's pain. And so I said, yeah. I went out and I read about it and I'm like, well, it looks like this can happen. So I'm not a doctor, but I'm going to say if it wasn't hurting before, then just take it, take the whole tablet the next day and I'll let them know what happened. And then they can tell us how to manage this. So that's what he did. And, um, and so they said just to stay on it. So now he's, he's back up to the full tablet and I guess he's tolerating these lower blood pressure. So they're letting him go for a while and we're going to see how this works out. But oddly enough, uh, last week he had a a pain in his um, upper left chest into his shoulder. And he didn't tell me about it until this past weekend when I went to visit him because I don't live close to him. I live two and a half hours away, but I drove up to visit him and he told me about this. And I'm like, and he said, well, it was just because of what I ate. And I said, Mel, look, you got to tell me every time you have this pain because that's a serious thing. But what I would like to understand better, when you do have a pain in your chest, like is I've read a lot about it being in like how you get shoulder pain and that kind of stuff. What causes it to, what causes the pain to end up being like into your shoulder? Um, so sometimes it depends on what's blocking, you know, so, so it depends on what's causing like a heart attack. So if it's a vessel that's being blocked, think of it as, um, almost like a nerve ending, um, either getting aggravated. So, um, Ooh, somebody can't see me. Oh, I see what the problem is. I, I can't see me either. Um, yeah, I, can't, I can't see you either. Odd. No, my video's on. Very odd. Let me see. Kathleen, that's been a while that you haven't been able to be seen. Well, I apologize for that, guys. I had <laughs> no idea. Um, I thought it might have to do with the, um, you know, that you were filming it or whatever. Oh, that so. I went back and forth? Yeah. Yeah. Could be. True. So I, but I didn't hide self view. I'm trying to show me. I, but you're right. There's something about my camera not being shown, actually. Um, okay. Um, so yeah, so I don't know that we all, that we know that I can d- definitively say why uh, it's going into your shoulder. Uh, sometimes, the, the way sometimes that we figure out whether it's epigastric pain, you know, pain for your stomach and your esophagus versus heart attack is we give you like a miracle drink and you drink it and you know if it's gas related or stomach related the pain goes away and everybody goes oh that's probably not a heart attack (laughs) so you know while we're running the other numbers we do that and we can kind of tell so you know um but it's really kind it is kind of tough i'm I'm not suggesting that every time you have a twinge you go right to 911 um, but if you're paying attention, I, I pretty much guarantee you'll know when you should call 911. Okay, that's fine. I, I'm just going to, I'm just going to keep monitoring it with them. And I ask them every single day. So I just figure if it happens a couple more times, then I'm going to make certain I share it with the cardiologist. Yep. And the other thing is they can actually, uh, they could run blood work and they would be able to, um, they would be able to tell if there was an incident uh, that troponin might still be elevated. So they, they might be able to tell just from blood work if there was okay. something that came on. Just Thank FYI. you. All right. I have a question. Uh, I'm 82. Yes. I'm 82 and I have just a primary care. I've been kind of thinking I should have a geriatric doctor, but people don't seem to know of any around here. I live on Cape Cod. Nobody seems to know mm-hmm. of any. Uh, do you think that's important or does my primary care, one, one person told me a primary care is a geriatric doctor and I don't, I don't believe that. Well, so on the Cape, uh, maybe, um, cause, because there's so many elderly on the Cape, they should kind of be pretty good at it. However, how do you feel about your primary care? Just like the other lady, I think she's very superficial. I could probably have a a rare disease and she wouldn't know it. Yeah, so that's the bigger problem. Uh, so you, again, Cape Cod, I, I, it's, it's exceptionally hard uh, to find one, um, but I would suggest you start looking. Um, I think 
there's some people that are very happy with bramble book bramble oh yeah bramble bush yeah yeah and then there's another one um i've heard dr lisa out of sandwich is supposed to be quite good oh uh, i live in I sandwich i live in sandwich yeah i don't think she's taking people she but i could i can try again yeah, the sand that sandwich group. A lot of people are happy with the sandwich group because they're not part of Cape Cod Health. I personally, I think you'll get more time with a doctor if you're not part of Cape Cod Healthcare. Excellent. Just okay. My experience here on the Cape, unfortunately. Good. Thank you. All right, Kathleen. I had a question. Uh huh. Um, I'm on that six month recheck for my cholesterol. And I am, you know, mm -hmm. trying to do the suggestions that my PCP gave to me. What is the likelihood of the six month recheck, you know, having a change? I think it's very likely, actually, if you're doing some of the things. Um, this, okay. you know, if you can drive down the triglycerides, I, I have another webinar. If you went and looked um, on my on my website uh, on cholesterol and what makes the number. So okay. for a lot of people during COVID, triglycerides went up. There was a little more alcohol usage than, <laughs> than, mm -hmm. than we might have suggested as, you know, helpful. Um, so a fair number of people had a jump in triglycerides that I think you probably could bring down. So I think there's a fairly good chance. Okay, thanks. I'm keeping an eye on time here, people. I It should allow us to keep going, but it, it's slated to end at 7.30. So I'm just gonna <laughs> let you know if we all end up saying goodbye, that's why. <laughs> we have two minutes. I'm not getting a warning or anything. So I, I don't mind, I'll answer questions for as long as we have a screen. Anybody with any other questions? No? All right. Well, I hope that this was informative. Um, I believe next month, I think I'm going to go to the kidneys. Um, there's an awful lot of people with kidney issues and or urinary tract issues. And um, I'm going to head in that direction. So I think uh, after that, we might do lungs. But, <laughs> but next month, February will be uh, kidneys, kidneys and urinary tract. Okay. Thanks, Kathleen. Thank you. Thanks Thank everybody you. for joining um, and I hope to see you soon. Okay. Yeah. Stay healthy. Informative. Thank right. you. Bye-bye.